Good afternoon. Welcome to Cardia Kingdom Church. I'm Pastor Lee, Senior Pastor and Founder of Cardia Kingdom Church, and I just want to welcome you to our virtual Sunday service. We're extremely honored, grateful, and glad that you chose to be here with us here on today. Amen? There are a million other places you could have gone to worship, but you decided to be here with us on today. Amen? And we're so glad to have you. Listen, I want you to make yourself comfortable. I want you to actually engage with us here in the virtual worship center. I want you to feel free to interact, say amen, hallelujah, or do whatever God puts on your heart to do today, amen? Because as of today, we're family, amen? I want you to know that God has a special word that he sent us today, and I know with all my heart that he's going to bring you comfort, and he's also going to ignite something deep inside you today, amen? Listen, I believe with all my heart that you're not here by accident or by chance, amen? I believe that it was the Lord's plan for you to be here on today, right? I believe that God is going to do something extraordinary in your life today, and that after today, you'll never, ever be the same, right? We at Cardia are boldly following the Lord's purpose path to do his will and to build his kingdom, and I invite you to come along with us, amen? Listen, can you do me a quick favor? Can you just type in the virtual worship center where you're tuning in from and how you heard about Cardia Kingdom Church? Can you do that for me? And Cardia, would you take a moment and welcome our visitors and all of our guests and show them how we do love? Awesome. I appreciate it. Family, thanks again for coming, and I want you to sit back and enjoy the service. I interrupt your regularly scheduled programming for a moment of pastoral protocol. <laughs> Praise God, family. Pastor Lee here. Listen, I just wanted to bring you a quick word of pastoral training right quick. Now, as the people of God, as kingdom people, we must make it a practice to always bring an offering when we come to the house of God. Whenever you go to worship, go with an offering in your hand to the Lord. Not to the church, but to the Lord. Amen? Giving is a heart issue. And God uses giving as a way not just to sustain ministry, but to train hearts and to bless his people. Amen? We're going to be doing an intensive teaching on this coming in the month of February so that we learn the truth and the power of giving and tithing. So we live as true kingdom people with pure hearts. And also so that we live blessed because we're in the process of learning the power of sowing and reaping and the power of tithing properly. And it is blowing my mind. Amen. When you see what God is showing us, it's going to blow your mind and change your lives forever. I'm so excited and I can't wait to bring that teaching to you. Amen. 
So just take my quick and light little admonishing to heart and always come with an offering when you come into the house of God, whether in person physically or online virtually. Amen? Cardia Kingdom Church is a 100% tithing church. We tithe after the order of Melchizedek, which even precedes the law. And we know this is God's will, and we know this is God's way. So we tithe out of honor and love, and God just responds in wonderful and tremendous ways. And this we will do until the Lord returns. Amen? So listen, if you like to tithe or give an offering, we have a few ways to do so. Number one, you can just simply click the Give button right here uh, in the Virtual Worship Center. Number two, you can cash up Cardia at dollar sign Cardia Church. That's dollar sign C-A-R-D-I-A-C-H-U-R-C-H. Number three, you can give on our website at www.cardia.church forward slash give. Thank you in advance for your kindness, your love, and your generosity. God bless, and we return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Hello everybody, I'm Jamie Arnie here to remind you to get social. Get social by inviting people to church. So right now, you can just click the little button right here in the virtual worship center. Get social by interacting live in the virtual worship center during the service at any time. You can say amen, say hi, bring fit your favorite sermon point, or just say thank you Jesus. Get social by following us on all social media platforms. Yeah, right now we'll be. Okay, this is Kayana reminding you to get social. Bye! Cynthia Lewis is a mortgage industry leader with more than 15 years of experience. Following college in 2003, she quickly set her sights on the real estate industry with one goal in mind, to build wealth. I just learned that if I showed up every day and did the things that I was doing, I could make a lot of money. And in making a lot of money, I could do the things that I wanted to do or I could buy what I wanted to buy. I built this life that I never thought would come to an end. However, within a few short years, Cynthia's world came crashing down. The housing and lending crisis hit, and she was unable to support her high spending lifestyle. She had to liquidate her home and several rental properties she could no longer afford. It was like a ton of bricks literally just fell on you. I felt shame over identity being tied up in things. I felt shame over the choices I made. In 2008, Cynthia moved to Atlanta hoping for new opportunities. She got a job in the financial industry earning a quarter of what she was previously making. Battling depression and overwhelmed with shame, she turned to God. I get to a point where I'm like, God, what more do you want from me? I was on my bathroom floor and I remember crying out to God and I just felt like at that point, I, I remember hearing these voices and I remember this voice saying, you should just take your life. Shame, frustration, not being able to rebound and, and just being stuck in this place. In that same moment, I immediately heard the voice of God say, come home. And it was at that point where I was like, Lord, I surrender. Cynthia resigned and moved back home with her parents. She started going back to church. I remember battling with, I just got to get everything back so that I can prove I haven't lost it all. I can prove that I'm still good. I can prove that I'm successful. In 2013, Cynthia joined a new firm where she found many of her coworkers were Christians. They began to pray and study the Bible together. And I'm really seeing my relationship with God personally flourish and it's getting deeper. I no longer cared about what I made. One day at a church, a guest speaker challenged her to trust God with her finances. And he was like, you know, if you believe the word of the Lord, if you trust God, sow this seed. And if you sow this seed, you'll never lack. Cynthia boldly stepped out on faith and gave her last thousand dollars. And I literally just got paid. So it was like, okay, Lord, you know, it's gonna be another 12 or 13 days before I get paid again. And this is all I have. And that was at that moment, I stepped out on his words and I was just like, Lord, I know you'll take care of me. I know you'll supply the lead. I don't even care about the excess anymore. Two days later, a stranger blessed her with $500, enough to take care of her bills until her next paycheck. Cynthia says her 10-year financial struggle was broken. 
Through tithing, the love of money and what money could do for me naturally broke off of me. Now I saw money as resources from God, a resource for the kingdom to further support the kingdom. Cynthia started consistently tithing and giving generously. Over the next five years, her income dramatically increased with a 35 to 45 percent gain every single year. I was the number one or top five producer every single year after that. I mean, it just it's it's amazing the doors that God began to open. It's amazing how things began to flourish. Everything that I felt that I lost in that season, the Lord began to restore back to me. Today, Cynthia is the owner of New Dominion Mortgage, a company set to exceed a million dollars in business revenue. Her salary has doubled from her highest earning year, which opened the door for her to buy a new home. Cynthia encourages everyone to give because God will reward your faithfulness. If you put it out there, it does come back to you. And it's not necessarily always in a dollar or a tangible amount, but He gives back to you more than you could ever, ever give to Him. And that's why the, the song says, you can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. Well, good afternoon, family. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Listen, I'm extremely glad and honored that you came to worship with us here today at Cardia Kingdom Church. I just want to know, are you ready for the word of God? Amen. Well, I certainly hope so because I'm ready to share the word. Amen. Listen, I want you to know that though we're in a virtual service, this is still a real and live interactive assembly. Amen. We've gathered together today as the scriptures have commanded to worship God to hear from God and to fellowship together, amen? So listen, I don't want you to just sit and watch like this is a television show, right? I want you to engage and to interact today, amen? As a matter of fact, can you do me a favor right now? Uh, do me a favor right now and just type the word amen in the virtual worship center. Can you just type amen right now for me? Amen, okay. I see some uh, amens, I see a few more amens. Okay, all right. Well, amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, people of God. Now listen, can you do me one more favor? Now can you just send me some hearts? Can you just look on your screen and find the button for the hearts? Can you just send me some hearts? Amen? Can you just send me some hearts? Can you just click the heart emoji and send me some love? Amen. Amen. I feel the love. That's what I'm talking about. I'm feeling the love. So listen, family, please do feel free to interact fully in the service today. Let me know you're here. Let me know you're hearing me. I want you to feel free to reach out to say amen, hallelujah, restate your favorite sermon point, send the clapping hands emoji, hearts, or whatever God puts on your heart to share, amen? Listen, we're literally learning how to do virtual church right now, just like we had to learn how to do in-person worship back in the day. 
Y'all remember we had to actually learn how to do church. There was church protocol, church etiquette, amen. Listen, family, we're in a whole new world now. We're relearning things we thought we already knew. But somehow, in some way, we've been ushered into this brand new world, right? This new reality. Now, in this new world, we have some new technology, some new norms, uh, some new ways of doing pretty much everything now. Am I right about it? And as a people, we've been through a whole lot in these last few years, right? I mean, from the pandemic to this new economy to rapidly shifting social standards. I mean, if you're like me, you've lost some things, right? You, you might have lost friends, you might have lost loved ones, you might have lost relationships. And with so much change and so much loss, sometimes we might all begin to wonder, am I gonna be okay? Hey man, are we going to be okay? Or is it just me? Well, I certainly hope not. Over the last few years, I can personally testify that I've gone from being calm, confident, cool, and composed to testy, timid, tame, and tentative, amen? I could never even have dreamed up in my worst nightmare that I would have endured what I've endured, lost what I've lost, and would be faced with some of the things that I've been faced with. And what's crazy is that the whole world has been experiencing the same thing, right? I've never seen or heard of a more tumultuous period of rapid change, drastic loss, and constant instability and prolonged uncertainty in the recorded history of the world. I mean, just this week, we've had a thick, dark orange haze that covered the city of New York so heavily that city officials say that it has broken city records for the highest air pollution and the least breathable and most hazardous air the city has ever seen, ever, right? Headlines this week read, orange skies and burning eyes. We also had a white Florida woman charged with fatally and intentionally shooting her black neighbor through her front door. I mean, for real, it's like, what? Who consequently was granted bond by the end of the week, by the way. Then we had a former US president indicted for the second time this year on seven additional federal felony charges, amen? And on top of all that, some of our oldest, most trusted and respected religious leaders seem to be dying off back to back to back to back. Rabbi Zacharias, Charles Stanley, LaShawn Pace, Morris Cirillo, Lois Evans, and now even the other day, Pat Roberts. I mean, these are the people that we look to for leadership as our example, amen, as the standard. The people we look to to represent righteousness, amen, in our generation and to help lead the way are no longer here with us, amen? And I don't know about you, but the things that have occurred in the last few years, both naturally and spiritually, have more than superseded my worst fears and have gone far beyond anything in my wildest imagination. I didn't have enough fear inside of me to ever even conceive of some of the realities that we've actually had to endure in our society here in these last few years. Am I right about it? I didn't have enough fear to fear up some of this stuff, right? We've now come to live in a world where fear, trauma, drama, dysfunction, death, and scandal are our new normal, amen? We live every day with that uneasy pit in our stomachs. And if you're anything like me, now you get ready to face each new day full of caution and trepidation like, oh Lord, what's next? So much so that it leads us to ask the questions deep in our hearts. Are we gonna be okay? Listen, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to the book of Isaiah and turn down to the 41st chapter at the 10th verse. That's Isaiah 41 and 10. Now, if you're worshiping with us for the very first time, I want you to know that we have Version Bibles integrated right here in the Virtual Worship Center. Just tap the Bible tab underneath the screen and turn over to Isaiah 41 and 10, amen? Isaiah 41 verse 10 reads like this in the King James Version. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Today, people of God, God answers the question we've been asking him in our hearts by sending us a message today entitled, It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Bow your heads, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us here today, O God. We, your people, have gathered together today as you have commanded. We have come together from various places all over the world today to hear a word from you and from you alone today, O God. We come today, Lord, with hearing and hearkening hearts, Lord. 
We are ready to do everything we hear today, O oh God. Father, only your word, your love, and your presence can satisfy our needs today, O oh God. So we want you to know that you are welcome here, Lord. You are welcome to manifest your presence in our homes today, O oh God, in our cars today, O oh God, in our very lives, Lord. It is in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. Our text today is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Now, the book of Isaiah is generally regarded as consisting of two parts. The first part consisting of chapters 1 through 39, where the prophet Isaiah condemns the Israelites for their sin and idolatry, warning them to repent and return to God or suffer the consequences of their disobedience. This first section concludes with Isaiah telling King Hezekiah that Judah will be conquered and its inhabitants will be carried away into exile. Conversely, the second section of Isaiah focuses on hope and restoration, where God promises to send forth the servant of the Lord to deliver Israel from their enemies and to bring salvation to God's people. Amen? God's role as savior and protector of Israel is one of the key themes in the second section of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah's prophecies help the Israelites to acknowledge God's sovereignty and his faithfulness, even in the midst of their calamity. In other words, God lets them know in the midst of their mess that everything is going to be okay. It's powerful to see that even as God keeps his word to punish the Israelites for their sin and disobedience, he also lets them know that trouble won't last always and that a deliverance date is coming. Amen. And we see in the word that God fulfilled his promise of deliverance and salvation to Israel, just as he said he would. Am I right about it? In Isaiah 41.10, God tells the Israelites not to fear or be dismayed, for God is with them. God promised to deliver the Israelites from their enemies and from the devastation of their own disobedience. God promised to be with them even in the midst of their trials, trauma, and tribulations. He promised to strengthen them and to help them to persevere. He promised them that everything was going to be okay. And ultimately, he did deliver them from their adversaries. Say, so he did it again. He did it again, right? Now the phrase righteous right hand, as mentioned in Isaiah 41.10, is a representation of God's power, authority, and blessing. I'll say that again. The phrase righteous right hand, as mentioned in our text today, is a representation of God's power, authority, and blessing. So when God speaks of holding his people up with his righteous right hand, he's literally saying that he will use his power and all of his authority to deliver his people from the curse of sin and exile, bless them with his presence and salvation. Amen? In other words, because of the power and promises of God's righteous right hand, everything was going to be all right. Amen? Everything was going to be all right. And a closer look at the words, God's right hand and the word of God can shed a bit more light on the fullness of the power and promise of that phrase. Exodus chapter 15 and 6 reads, Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Matthew 26, 64 says, Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Psalm 17 and 7 says, Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior, of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. And Psalms 18 and 35 says, You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. In each of these verses, which represents a span of time consisting of thousands of years, the right hand is described as a place of strength and authority, and is a symbol of God's presence, protection, and blessing. Amen? And regardless of the enemy face or the situation at hand, whenever God's right hand shows up, everything ended up being all right. Say amen to that. Now, here's what I love about our text today and ultimately what I love about God in general. And that is, despite Israel's sin and rebellion, God never forgot about them or forsook them. Amen. He promised to deliver them from their enemies, distresses and troubles, and he always blessed them with his presence and the power of his right hand. Amen. Despite the discomfort and desperation of their circumstance, the Israelites never had a reason to fear. For God had given his promise, and his promise was that he would be with them through their trials and that he would deliver them from their hardships. Amen? God was with the children of Israel 
whether they faced giants or armies, famines or pharaohs, God proved himself faithful regardless of what they went through and he always had his people's back. And he time and time again showed up and showed out and caused everything to be all right. Say amen to that. So even now with millennia after millennia of proof of God's consistent willingness and divine ability to make everything okay for his people, which now includes us, we have to now stop and examine what it means to us to be okay. No, really. We have to authentically take an honest and mature look at what okayness really means to us, right? Like, when will we really know if and when we're okay? Amen? What does okay look like for us, right? Watch this. For many people in our generation, and I'm including believers in this thing too now, y'all. For many people in our generation, when we take a good, long, honest look at how we define our okayness, which we'll call our okayness algorithm right? Our okayness algorithm or the form that we use to measure and calculate our okayness, right? As we examine our okayness algorithm, we have to ask ourselves a deep and searing question, right? The question we have to ask is, is our okayness kingdom or carnal, right? Is our okayness kingdom or carnal? Is our okayness algorithm or the form that we use to calculate our okayness based on kingdom values and principles or is it based on carnal values and principles? Amen? Is our okayness based on peace and purity or things and things? Is our okayness based on faith and love or fun and fantasy? Is our okayness based on Jesus and joy or money and materialism, right? If God was to examine our okayness algorithms, would he praise or punish? Truth is, many of us are not satisfied because we are not sanctified. I'll say that again. Many of us are not satisfied because we're not sanctified. Amen, somebody. Amen, lights, as the original Reverend Lee used to say. <laughs> Amen, lights, right? Now, in its most basic sense, to sanctify something is to set it apart for God's special use and purpose. Amen? Therefore, God's people are literally called to be sanctified because they are supposed to be set apart for God's special purposes in the earth. Right? Say set apart. That's right. Set apart. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 through 8 says this. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 8. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctified. People of God, too many of us don't feel okay because we're still not set apart from the world. Amen, somebody. We're still not set apart from the world. Our values, perspectives, dreams, desires, and standards are still identical to the world. Amen. We believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that God has raised Jesus from the dead and we claim to be saved, but because we have not been sanctified, we still identify in our hearts with the world. Amen. Our souls, which is our minds, will, and emotions still identify and too closely mirror the world around us and not the God within us. Say amen to that. I'll say that again. Our souls, which is our mind, wills and emotions still identify and mirror too closely the world around us and not the God within us. No, you still want what the world wants. Amen. You still value what the world values. And as God looks at your heart to check your okayness algorithm, he sees that despite the faithfulness of his presence, his promise and his right hand, you still don't feel okay because you don't measure your okayness by kingdom standards. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So here's the million dollar question. Who sets your standards, right? Who sets your standards? And here's the revelation. Some of us will never be okay until we renew our minds according to Romans 12 and two, which says this, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. People of God, now is the time, and today is the day to renew your mind to kingdom standards as set forth in the word of God, and you'll then discover that you don't have to wait on the world to change in order for you to be okay. Amen? As you renew your mind and reset your okayness algorithm to kingdom standards, you'll realize that God has already made everything okay. 
Say amen to that. Amen. So as you reset your okayness algorithm to kingdom standards, you'll realize that everything God has already done is much more than enough to cause you to have well-being, peace, contentment, safety, security, and fulfillment. And for the circumstances in your life that are not okay, let's keep it real. There are some circumstances in your life that really are not okay. Amen. But you'll come to quickly discover that even though your circumstances may not all be okay, you're still okay. Amen. You're still okay. Watch this. Watch this. Another powerful blessing that comes from allowing God to reset your okayness algorithm and being sanctified, living with a renewed mind, living by faith in God and his word is the immeasurable blessing of being okay when everything in your life is not okay. Amen. That's right. We have the grace and the gift as believers of being okay when everything is not okay. Am I right about it? Philippians chapter four, verses 11 through 13 reads like this in the King James. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. See, people of God, one of the devil's biggest deceptions is to try and trick you and me out of our okayness with the devious device of discontentment. Amen? The devious device of discontentment. Amen? Do you not know that discontentment is demonic? Amen? I'll say that again. Discontentment is demonic because it only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen? Discontentment damages your okayness by robbing you of the most essential thing you need as a believer to be okay, which is your peace. Amen. Discontentment robs you of peace because you will never have peace regardless of what you do or don't have in your life. Amen. It will keep you on a merry-go-round of running and running and running after more, but will torment you to death by never allowing you to have enough. Say amen to that. And contrary to popular belief, discontentment isn't a little firecracker that explodes and maybe burns your hand and only requires a band-aid. No, discontentment is a bomb that blows up and completely rips apart your life, your relationships, and your faith until you end up with a Humpty Dumpty life where you can't put the pieces back together again, no matter how hard you try. Amen. Most believers treat discontentment like it's a little common cold when in truth, it's a malignant cancer trying to end your life. No, as kingdom people, we absolutely must begin to follow the Apostle Paul's example and begin to renew our minds. We must begin to restore our faith in Christ and what he's already done for us. Amen. We must ask God to reset our okayness algorithm so we can have kingdom contentment and say like the Apostle Paul, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. For I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Amen. Philippians chapter four, verses 11 through 13 gives us a powerful picture of what true okayness looks like. Amen. Stable, strong, consistent, unmovable peaceful and unbothered. Amen. Regardless of any and everything going on around us. Amen. All throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelations, the Lord says, fear not. I got you. It's going to be okay. And coincidentally, these comforting words, fear not, appear in the Bible 366 times. One for each day of the year plus one for leap year. Amen. But no matter how many times these comforting words of encouragement appear in scripture, let us always remember that they are spoken by the creator of the universe to the people he loves. Amen. It is he who tells his children not to fear because he can steal and stop the raging storm. Amen. He can slay your greatest giant and he can heal the most broken heart. Amen. He can fix the most challenging problem and he can meet the most pressing need. Am I right about it? It is he who tells us not to be anxious 
and commands us not to fret about evil doers. It is he who invites us to cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us and promises to be with us forever, even to the end of the very age. It is he who charges us not to be discouraged or dismayed because he is our God. And that truth should be sufficient to cause us to trust him when he says it's going to be okay. Amen. It's going to be okay. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you. Are the words of his encouragement, for I am your God, fear not. When the God of the universe, who sent his one and only son to be our kinsman redeemer and pay the price for our sin on the cross, tells us not to worry, should we not simply take him at his word and not worry? If the God that has been faithful over thousands of promises throughout thousands of years, says it's going to be okay, shouldn't that be enough for us to just say, okay, amen? Shouldn't the presence of the Most High God in our problems be enough for us to be okay when everything is not okay? But there's one very special scripture in the Word of God that should be the very foundation of our faith in His faithfulness, right? There is one scripture that should make us okay even when everything is not okay. Amen. There is one scripture that should ignite our faith and our trust and cause an increase in our okayness every time and at all times. Amen. This one special scripture is found in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. And it reads like this in the King James. Verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Amen. Man is a creature consisting of a body of flesh and blood and of a soul, a created and finite spirit born sinful who goes astray from the womb speaking lies. No, but let God be true and every man a liar. He is God that cannot lie. His counsels of old are faithful and true. His promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. The scriptures inspired by him are true, and the prophecies of each of them are punctually accomplished throughout the ages. Say amen to that. Amen. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Whether it be with regard to things temporal, spiritual, or eternal, for there is no variableness nor shadow of turning in his mind. He never, ever, ever forgets his word. He foresees all things. He is able then to perform, and is true and faithful. And therefore, whatever is going out of his lips shall never be altered, but will most certainly be fulfilled. These precious verses are a clear picture of the immutability of God, which means the unchangeable nature of God, and specifically when it comes to his word. Amen. That which God says, God does. When God speaks, we can count on his word. Amen. We are fallible, but God is not. He is perfect in all his ways. And what he says is always true because God cannot lie. Isn't that powerful? This fact should ignite faith even in the most feeble heart. This fact should trigger trust even in the most doubtful heart. This fact should produce peace even in the most troubled mind. Say amen, somebody. The reason people's faith is so flawed in our generation is because we see everything as flawed and as fake as we are. Amen? I'll say that again. The reasons people's faith is so flawed in our generation is because we see everything as flawed and as fake as we are, amen? We don't have faith and we don't have trust and that destroys our okayness because we've come to see that so much in our world cannot be trusted because of deception and lies, amen? But here's the good news, amen? Here's the good news. The good news is that our God is not a man that can lie, right? He is God, eternal, flawless, and faithful. He will not change, and he will never lie or go back on his word. Say amen to that. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a really good place to give God some praise. Amen. I think that's a, a really good place to give him some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I remember a few years back, back in 2017, when we were first starting out in ministry. We were having services in our home, and I was sleeping that night before service. It had to be that Saturday night, right? And God spoke to my heart so clearly. And he said to me, all faith is, is believing that I'm not a liar. All faith is, is believing that I'm not a liar. And this truth hit me so hard, y'all. It hit me so hard because I never understood or could really believe that faith could be this easy. 
Amen? Because the one thing that we know for sure, for sure, and that is God is not a liar. Am I right about it? And as I began to reread my Bible, I discovered that all the Bible is, is a book of love where a loving God was proving his integrity and his faithfulness to his people time and time and time again. Amen? Literally, the entire Bible is God just proving that I am who I say I am and I will do what I say I will do. Amen? And if you watch the word from Genesis to Revelations, you'll find proof of this truth. Amen. God is saying in his word, you can track my truth. Amen. That's right. You can trust my truth because you can track my truth. Am I right about it? God is saying, just take a look at how faithfully I did what I've already done. And you can begin to believe me when I say now that it's going to be okay. Amen. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I can have faith in him not being a liar, right? I know that God is true to his word. I know God is faithful. And I believe in my heart that what he says he'll do, he'll do. I mean, that encounter literally had my faith transformed in an instant because I was fully persuaded that God's not a liar. Am I right about it? So when I began to read scriptures like our text today that says, fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I can believe that. When I read scriptures like Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I can believe that. When I read scriptures like 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9, which says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. I can believe that. Why? Because I know that I know that God's not a liar. Amen? I know that I know that God's not a liar. So if he said it, I can believe it. That settles it. Amen. I'll say it again. Because I know that I know that God's not a liar. So if he said it, I can believe it. That settles it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. See, the number one factor of our faith and the guarantee of our okayness must never be based on ourselves or our circumstances, but on the absolute unbreakable integrity of the Most High God. Amen? The God who cannot lie. We can rest in him because we can rest in his word. Amen? And he gave us his word, not just as a set of rules to live by, but as a rock solid guarantee that what he said he will do he's going to do. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Lee Strobel, a beautiful and a great man of God and famous author, wrote this in his book, The Case for the Real Jesus. He said, faith is only as good as the one in whom it's invested. Amen. Faith is only as good as the one in whom it's invested. Titus 1 and 2 says, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Romans 3 and 4 says, not at all, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 24 says, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Joshua 23 and 14 says, and behold this day, I am going the way of all the earth and ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you, all are coming to pass unto you. And not one thing, look at your neighbor and say, not one thing, amen? Not one thing, not one thing, not one thing, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Not one thing hath failed thereof, amen? For the believer, there is so much comfort in knowing that God has been faithful to his promises, amen? Since God's word is always true, the Christian can place complete and absolute trust in his promises, amen? So how do we know that we know that it's going to be okay? Because the God who has never lied said in Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The God who has never failed said in Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Because the God who has performed every one of his promises said in Isaiah 40 and 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And because the God who died so you can live said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, based on God's integrity, his faithfulness, and his power, I will trust in the Lord. I will believe him when he says it's going to be okay. Amen. I decided that I'm going to believe him when he tells me it's going to be okay because of his faithfulness and his integrity. Amen. I decided that I'm going to be like the prophet Isaiah who said in Isaiah chapter 12, verse two, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is my salvation, and I believe now that it's going to be okay. I've decided that I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul and be content whatever state I find myself in, regardless of the confusion, dysfunction, and distress going on around me in this world. I will place my trust in the Lord who told me it's going to be okay. I've made up in my mind that I will be like King David who said in Psalms 118 and 5, I called upon the Lord in my distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. In other words, it's going to be okay. Amen. It's going to be okay. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's going to be okay. Amen. I was studying the word of God recently, and I was reminded of the story in John chapter four about a government official who had came before Jesus to ask him to heal his son. The passage in great detail spoke about how the official pleaded with Jesus to quickly go to his house before his little boy died. Amen. Jesus, however, responded to that official that he should just simply go back home. And Jesus assured him that his son would certainly live. Well, ironically, the man just decided to take Jesus at his word and believe him. So the man turned around and started on his journey back home. Amen. While on his journey back, some of his servants ran up and met him on the road with news that his son was both alive and well. So after rejoicing and praising God for keeping his word and giving him this miracle, the official stopped in his tracks, paused and asked his servants, uh, about what time did my son start to feel better? The servants told him that it was the day before at around one o'clock. His fever suddenly broke and completely disappeared. Then the man suddenly realized that Jesus had told him that his son would live at precisely the same time that day. Amen? And as I recalled and replayed this Bible story in my mind, all I could hear in my heart was, it's already done. <laughs> it's already done. Amen? Now, I don't know who needs to hear this today in your heart, but it, it's already done, right? It's already done. Look at your neighbor and say, it's already done. Amen? And I don't know what's going on in your world or what you're asking God to do, but you need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth out loud that it's already done. Amen? It's already done. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen, people of God, I sincerely believe with all my heart that there are times when we kneel in prayer and before we even get up, before we can get the words out of our mouths, God has already answered our prayer, amen? We just might not have seen it yet in the natural, but it's, it's already done, right? Just as God answered that official prayer in that instant, we should be encouraged that he is doing the very same things in our lives today, even right now. Thank you, Jesus. The next time uncertainty, doubt, or fear creeps in about whether God has heard or answered one of our prayers, let us cling to the words of Isaiah 65, 24, which says, before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Say it again, it's already done. Amen, it's already done. How do we know it's going to be okay? Because the God who cannot lie said so, amen? How do we know for sure, for sure, that it's going to be okay? Because it's already done. Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. And we declare that it is so right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing. The anointed Pace Sisters.
Father God, we come to you in prayer this afternoon to thank you and to praise you for all that you are and for all that you've done. Father, we thank you for your promise to be with us and to hold us up with your righteous right hand. Lord, we know that we are not alone and that you are always with us no matter what challenges we may face in this life. Lord God, help us to experience the power of your presence and to find strength in your love. Father, give us the courage and faith to face whatever lies ahead of us and to persevere full of grace. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness and for your love. Help us to experience your presence in a deeper and more sure way, O oh God. Father, we know that there are times that fear has replaced faith in our hearts. And why should we fear when you have told us so many times to fear not? Thank you, Lord God, for your promise to be with us always, to strengthen us, and to uphold us with your righteous right hand, for which we just want to say thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name forever. We know that you're faithful, and we know that because you always keep your promises, it's going to be okay. It is in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Thank you, Lord God. Amen. Most important invitation you'll ever receive. I'd like to invite you right now to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I believe that if you're listening to me right now, it's time you receive the free gift of salvation, eternal life, and entrance into the Lord's kingdom and his royal family. As you begin this new life in Christ, there are a few key scriptures you need to build your faith and begin your new walk upon. Number one, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Number two, Acts 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. In other words, salvation is not and cannot be found in anyone else. Number three, John 14 verse six. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Finally, on Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, it reads, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Please close your eyes and pray this prayer out loud with me. Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Your word says that you love me and that you died and rose again so that I might have a legal right to salvation by grace through faith. Jesus, your word says that if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that I would be saved. Well, Lord Jesus, I believe and do now confess this truth. Therefore, based on the truth of your word and the faith in my heart, I declare and confess that I am saved. Now, family, if you prayed this prayer with us today, will you confirm your confession and notify us by clicking the I'm Saved button in the chat and by giving us your contact information so we can reach out to you with some materials to help you in your new walk of salvation. Now it's time to connect with a good Bible-based church so you can grow and begin to pursue your kingdom purpose. Amen and congratulations. 
Hello, everybody. I'd like to take this time to invite you to join Cardia Kingdom Church and let us be your new church home and your new church family. Amen. We are a church for people just like you. We are a brand new church with plenty of room for your gifts and callings to operate and grow. We invite you to come and grow with us and to partner with what God is doing in and through this house. Amen. We are on a mission, a mission to enter, manifest, and build the kingdom of God and love his people very well while we're doing it. Amen? Listen, if you don't currently have a church home and you feel a call to join this church, this body of kingdom believers, I want you to know that you're welcome here. Listen, if you'd like to join this church, just click the Become a Member button right now in the Virtual Worship Center. Give us some information and we will receive you into this fellowship and we'll begin this journey together. Or if you want to join some other time, just visit our main website and go to www.cardia.church forward slash become a member and just click the tab on the menu. Amen. Listen, I look forward to welcoming you as our newest Cardia Kingdom Church member very, very soon. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. And I look forward to seeing you next Sunday at the same time. Go out and have an amazingly blessed week. Talk to you soon. God bless.